Before you get airborne, you have to pay close attention to safety right here on the ground. You need to be constantly vigilant to protect your passengers and yourself. In this program, we'll look at pre-flight checks, refueling, passenger briefing and prop swinging. Hand swinging a propeller is fraught with danger. And there are many reasons for this. Firstly, a propeller is able to kick back while it's being handled on the ground and this can cause it to suddenly flick backwards uh, while you're still holding it. And the real danger of that is that the trailing edge of the propeller is the sharp edge, and that's exactly where your fingers are likely to be. If the starting procedure is being conducted on loose gravel or wet grass, the person swinging the prop can lose their balance and lose their footing, and it goes without saying that'd be particularly dangerous in front of a propeller. Also, uh, an aeroplane that isn't properly secured during hand starting, may in fact move forward. If uh, the engine starts with more than the uh, desired amount of power, uh, again with obvious dangerous results. It's a pilot's worst nightmare, a plane running down the tarmac with no one at the controls. Three children were inside this four-seater Cessna when their father hand started the engine and it took off at full throttle. It was just accelerating really fast along the taxiway on the smooth and the pilot was running along trying to, trying to get inside it. I'd say when he, I guess he hand cranked it and it bolted over the chocks and uh, he would have been trying to get in there and stop it. The Salvation Army owned plane sped about 100 metres through the light aircraft zone. A wingtip clipped another plane throwing it onto one wheel, slicing through the back of a second parked aircraft. At some point the pilot caught up with the plane and got inside before it slammed into another Cessna parked on the tarmac. Now, bits and pieces were flying all over the place. All well, the noise stopped because the engine stalled and when it cleaned up the other aeroplane. People running from all directions, you know, we didn't know who was in the aeroplane and who wasn't. And uh, just trying to get people out of it. The owner of the three aircraft hit by the runaway plane praised the men who braved spilt fuel to make sure everyone was out of the wreckage. I think there's a lot of heroism here today. It's hard not to get emotional at this stage, but I'd say that uh, there were men ran out and, and uh, face danger to uh, rescue the kids. They're pretty shaken. Um, little girl was crying. Um, little fellow we got out. A 13 year old kid was completely soaked in fuel. An investigation has started with questions remaining over why the aircraft was hand started and why the throttle was set at high speed. Michael Coggan, ABC News, Darwin. It was only luck that no one was hurt. Modern aircraft with their engine ignition systems just aren't designed for prop swinging. A propeller should be treated like a loaded gun because of the switching mechanism on magnetos. Magnetos are designed to fail safe. That is to say that in flight, if a, switch, if a fault develops within the switching mechanism and the wiring, the magneto will continue to operate, which is uh, a very nice idea when you're over the mountains at night in a single engine aeroplane. However, when the aeroplane is parked on the ground, if there's a fault in the magneto switching system, then we have to consider the fact that a magneto turns itself off by diverting the current that would have gone to the spark plugs harmlessly to earth. If, the, uh, if there's a fault in that earth wiring system, then the magneto can't discharge that current to earth, and when the impulse fires, the current will run through the leads and a spark will occur. And of course, there's no way for a pilot to be sure that there is a fault or is, is or is not a fault in the ignition system. The, uh, the switches, the key can be in the off position. Uh, that's no guarantee that there isn't a fault in the earth wiring. The safest thing to do is to always treat the magneto as though it was alive. That is, as though it was a loaded gun. Another consequence of hand starting is the possibility that if the hand start is successful and the aeroplane is now in fact uh, sitting there with the engine running, it should be remembered that an alternator requires some battery power to excite the uh, alternator in the first place. If a battery is dead flat, it's possible that the engine can be running due to the magnetos, but in fact the alternator is offline, producing no current at all. This could lead to a situation where the pilot, having gone through the hazards of hand start, becomes airborne only to realise he has no radios, no electrics in general. The whole dangerous exercise has been for nothing. He returns to land after all, and uh, the whole argument's over. The 
vintage aircraft are designed for hand starting and there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Again, you'll need training from an experienced and qualified expert. The right precautions and good communication and procedures are vital. You ready? Ready when you are. Throttle set. Throttle is set. Brakes on. Brakes are on. Contact. Contact. As we can see from the Tiger Moth, it's an aircraft that is designed for propeller starting with fully accessible controls. If we have a look at a modern aircraft, we can see how dangerous it is with the controls a long way away from the propeller. As you've heard, the best advice is don't prop swing a modern aircraft, it's too dangerous. If you do find yourself in a situation where there really isn't any option, don't try it unless you've had training from a qualified person. Most refuelling happens from bowsers or tankers. When refuelling from a tanker, make sure that you order the right grade of fuel. Don't remove the fuel cap. That's a refueler's job. They've got their own safety procedures, including bonding. After refuelling, it's the pilot's job to check that the fuel cap is secure. Self-serve facilities for both Avgas and Jet A1 are becoming more common. After you position your aircraft for refuelling, turn off the radio, magnetos and ignition, then remove the key. In the aircraft's flight manual, look up the correct grade of fuel. Follow the safety instructions. Check the Bowser for the grade of fuel. To guard against static, use the bonding cable that's provided. All facilities have fire extinguishers, an emergency shut-off button and a spill kit know where they are. Connect the lead to the aircraft's bonding point. It's best to use protective gear. Contact with fuel can cause serious skin and eye problems. The fuel nozzle is colour-coded. Red for Avgas and black for Jet A1. Double check the fuel grade against the placard near the fuel cap. Bond the nozzle to the aircraft and touch it to discharge any potential static before you remove the fuel cap. Monitor the amount to avoid spill. Replace the fuel cap before removing the bonding line. When you're dealing with drums, there are some things you need to be clear about. The main issues are the right fuel, contaminants and precautions against ignition. If you use the wrong fuel or the fuel's over 12 months old, it could cost you. You could be up for an expensive repair bill or worse, your engine could fail at the worst possible time. So how do you make sure you've got the right fuel? You check the drum label to see if it's the right type and grade of fuel for the aircraft. The flight manual will detail the recommended fuel and there will be a sticker on the aircraft near the fuel cap saying what kind of fuel should be used. The fuel should be less than 12 months old. You can work out its age from the fill date on the drum. Dirty fuel or fuel with water in it is a serious hazard, so make sure your fuel is clean. Contaminants can cause a lot of damage. The first line of defence against fuel contamination is correct storage. They should be stored on their sides to stop water collecting on the top of the drum and seeping in. Use timber rails to keep them off the ground and secure them with chocks. The bungs should be at the three and nine o'clock positions. This helps keep the fuel in good condition and makes it easier for you to spot a leak. Refueling must be done more than five meters from a sealed building. For unsealed buildings, it's nine meters for a light aircraft and 15 meters for heavier aircraft. You should be at least six meters away from any other aircraft and 15 meters from a public area. Make sure the aircraft engine the radio, magnetos and master switches are off. No one should be on board and the area should be clear of people not involved in the operation. 
It goes without saying, there should be no sources of ignition anywhere near the refueling operation. No matches or lighters, no smoking, and no mobile phones or other electrical equipment. Phyllis and Mick Walsh from Mansfield in country Victoria have a wealth of experience in drum refueling. Well, I do a fair bit of flying over the tiger country through the summer season. And I don't want any stuff ups with um, water and fuel or anything like that. And we've decided from the word go that we had to get it right. And also to get my AOC, I also needed to have everything right as well. And yeah, if you're going to fly, you do it right. Like Phyllis and Mick, if you're moving a lot of drums around, it's best to have a trolley or lift. It could save your back. Tilt the drum with a timber chock so that you can collect a sample from the low point of the drum where contaminants settle. Make sure the fuel and the drum are okay. When you examine a drum, you should uh, check that it's still in uh, good condition. One danger uh, with, uh, with drums is if they are damaged externally, the internal lining, which is an epoxy uh, paint, may peel away from the surface of the, of, from the internal surface of the drum. This can be uh, a contaminant which will block uh, fuel filters. Check the batch number and fill date to ensure that the fuel is not too old. Check that the bung seals are in place so you know that you're getting fuel that hasn't been tampered with. Remove the seals, remove the bung, draw out fuel from the low area with a tube. Put the sample into a glass jar. Be sure that the tube and all the equipment used in fuel sampling are clean and dry. Cite the fuel sample for color, sediment or cloudiness. Swirling the fuel will bring any sediment into view. It's best to use a water finding paste to test for water. Swirl it thoroughly through the fuel sample. If there's water, the paste will change color. If there's no water or other contaminant, fit the pump. Position the trolley or drum so that the hose will easily reach the fuel tank and can be moved in case of an emergency. To prevent a spark igniting fuel vapor, you need to bond the aircraft and all fueling equipment to ensure they're the same electrical potential. Bond the drum to earth, then bond the drum to the aircraft. You need to have two fire extinguishers of an approved type close to hand in case of an emergency. Don't use water, it will only spread a fuel fire. The pump should be fitted with a filter. Examine the fuel in the filter for contaminants. Touch the nozzle to the aircraft to discharge any static. Bond the nozzle to the aircraft, then remove the fuel cap. It's best to have two people, one at the nozzle and one at the pump. Know how much fuel the aircraft will need and monitor the tank to avoid spill. Okay. Once you've finished refueling, secure the fuel cap and remove the nozzle bonding lead. Then return the nozzle to the pump and cap it before removing the remaining bonding leads. In the unlikely event that a spill occurs, follow the three C's. Control, stop the spill. Contain, keep the fuel from damaging the environment. Clean up, use rags or absorbent paper to mop up. As part of the pre-flight inspection, it's the pilot's responsibility to ensure that the aircraft fuel cap is secure. You should also do a fuel drain for contaminants in the aircraft's fuel. A part doesn't have to be moving to do your damage. Be careful when you're doing your pre-flight checks. Metal surfaces can be as sharp as a knife. Guard against sudden and unexpected movement of control surfaces by the wind or another person at the controls. And be really careful before checking hinges or wires. Take special care around edges at head height. Some moving surfaces can act like a guillotine. They can take a finger off or crush your hand. Your passenger may not have flown in a light aircraft before. They depend on you. Take the time to explain the trip and what they can expect. 
They need to take some water because you can easily get dehydrated at altitude. Check whether your passengers are carrying any dangerous goods. That works. Yeah, it's actually dangerous goods. Some people carry them. Hairspray, do you have any hairspray? Yeah, I've got a hairspray. Yeah, can I have a look at it? Yeah, see, that's, this is a dangerous good set. It's a fun little game. Before you go out onto the apron, warn your passengers about any hazardous conditions, such as other aircraft, propellers, and airside vehicles. Lead them on a clear, safe path to the aircraft. Don't let them wander off. As the pilot in command, you are responsible for their safety. Explain how to board and get off safely. There are different considerations for both low and high wing aircraft. Make sure that they know how to keep their balance. Show them how to use the seat belts. Demonstrate how to operate the door handles. Run through the emergency procedures and show them how to work the headphones. It's good practice to explain all aspects of the aircraft.